Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vals and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 181, we're going to talk about cables or interconnects. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise, <laughs> exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, when you're setting up a great system, you have to start somewhere. And my recommendation is the speakers. They'll determine a lot of what comes next. Then the source input, and most likely that's going to be digital, which means a DAC. But I'm going to recommend you think seriously about going all analog, which means vinyl. Next, you've got power amps and the preamp that feeds it, or in the case of vinyl, the preamps that feed the power amps. Okay, that's getting confusing, but I think you get what I mean. But how do we connect all this up properly? And that's the subject today. When I was a young wannabe audiophile, we grabbed whatever cables we had on hand. Often a new piece of gear came with a set of cables, so we'd use those. In the 70s, almost nobody thought interconnects were that important. We paid attention to them, but not nearly as much as we do today. And today we know better. In fact, if you want to achieve great sound, everything matters. And, and we have a lot more control over how we connect up our gear than ever before. And probably the single biggest difference uh, between the 70s and now is that material science uh, has moved along a lot. And a lot of engineers have put a lot of time into thinking about how to connect things up better. And a lot of uh, amateur uh, audio enthusiasts have put a lot of time into this topic as well. So with interconnects, you really only need to focus on four things, four important things. Number one, resistance. Number two, capacitance. Number three, noise rejection. And number four, functionality. That's your connectors, how flexible the cable is, the appearance, the aesthetics. What about all that other stuff people talk about? Skin effect, cryogenic freezing, dielectrics, etc., etc., including batteries that are strapped onto one end of the cable and not connected up. Well, if you focus on the top four that I think are important, everything else will be just fine. <laughs> okay, to better understand how we should, how best to connect up our gear, we need to really go and look at how 90% of our, more than 90% of our gear is actually connected up internally. That's right, we've got to move the signal around inside our preamps and amplifiers. And we do that just like we do outside, and we do it with wire. So, um, years ago, um, everything was point to point wired, and you would just basically take a wire and solder it onto one end and bring it to the other end of wherever you wanted to connect up, and Bob's your uncle. And a lot of that wiring was done with solid core 22 gauge. That was the standard. The gauge and the insulation changes depending on how much current and voltage you've got that you're running, of course. So all wire has a spec and it has to be honored when you're, um, when you're designing your own gear. You have to be very careful of that. Um, but these days, uh, we're more concerned with the fragility of a solid core wire, which back in the day would allow manufacturers to lay a wire in place in a chassis quite easily and it would stay put. But the problem with that solid core wire is that it tends to be a little brittle, more brittle certainly than stranded, and you can have uh, wire fatigue and you can lose um, a connection that way. So it's more common now um, to use stranded wire for hookups, certainly for mobile gear. It'll have a much longer and safer life. And for all of our kit amps, that's what we use. Is tw For almost all of the hookups, we use 22 gauge. Now, what if you've got a low voltage signal, uh, let's say coming off of your uh, moving magnet, 
uh, phono cartridge off your turntable, you'll have a signal that's down around 5 millivolts, a nominal 5 millivolts. And line voltage in a typical home audio system is roughly uh, 1 volt to 2 volts RMS, nominal. And um, that means that your, your phono cartridge is feeding 5 one thousandths of a volt volt <laughs> and what happens is if you pick up noise on that feed and you amplify it significantly in a phono preamp all the signal and all the noise combined expands so what do you do well you shield the wire and this is basically this wire here 22 gauge in the center and it's got a braided uh a fine wire, you can see it right here, around the insulated core. And what that does is two things. One, it rejects noise that might be present. Um, and two, if you connect this shield up to a ground return path, it'll actually drain it off. And, and that, that will take care of uh, the noise before it gets onto our conductor. But today, the vast majority of equipment uses PCBs, or printed circuit boards. And let me see if I can find one of my pointers. And basically, this is just a good quality uh, wire laid flat as a trace. It's the same thing as a point-to-point -point, um, wire, except that it's all laid flat onto a good sturdy board. This is one of our universal 6 or 12 SN7 uh, kit preamps. This is the newest version that Charles designed and they're brilliantly designed. Good solid boards, well laid out and of course um, the advantage of PCBs is it allows for uh, speed of manufacturing but in the case of kits it allows beginners um, and even experienced builders to, to build a high quality circuit without really uh, any problems. Point-to-point -point wiring requires more attention to positioning and is, uh, is, it, is a trickier prospect, certainly for beginners. Both are equally good. So most gear will be a combination of ribbon point-to-point uh, -point, uh, wiring and PCBs. This is a small PCB, but it is a two-sided PCB. And back in the day when I first started building gear, we only had one side of PCBs. And now I think our manufacturer can make uh, four layers on one board. <laughs> I'm presuming that's two on a side, but I'm not really sure. Charles is totally into figuring out a way in which we actually need to order a four layered board because he's totally into it. Um, but anyways, okay, so what does all this have to do with interconnects? Well, th this will help a lot in understanding what makes for a good interconnect. So let's just clear the decks a little bit here for a moment. And I'm going to grab, this is a little sample um, of a Blue Jeans cable. Um, Blue Jeans is in the US and they make really good quality gear cables, not gear. Um, and they're very affordable. If you live in the US, this is a great way to go. Uh, they do custom sizing and the quality of the manufacturing is very good. If you're outside of the US, I don't recommend them. The importing uh, stuff from them is just, it's really expensive. And it's one of the reasons why I ended up starting to design and build my own cables. And now we're gonna actually have um, uh, kit cables, uh, just like we have kit amps. And we're going to look at some of those in a minute. But let's take a look at the construction of this. Um, and let me grab uh, the end. So this is what the uh, finished end looks like. So this is a coaxial cable. This will handle an unbalanced signal. And, and of course, there are CA connectors. It has a little ferrule on the end of the wire. And that is that wire is essentially this wire, but it's a smaller gauge. and the reason why it's a smaller gauge is you get lower capacitance with a smaller gauge and the more you separate the conductor from the shield ground return path and there's your separator right here the more air and this essentially creates an artificial air barrier as well as an insulator uh, the lower the capacitance and so blue jeans calls these a low capacitance cable and they are in fact they're an industry leading cable now 
what about resistance? That was my first most important um, thing on my list. And resistance is predominantly a feature of gauge, so how thick the wire is and how long the wire is. And in my opinion, resistance is at least, if not even a little bit more important than capacitance. And as a result, I'm designing and building um, kit cables that are low resistance cables with reasonable amounts of capacitance. And if you increase the, the gauge, so make the wire thicker, you reduce the, you reduce the resistance but you increase the capacitance. So, like everything in life and audio, you have to find a balance between the two of them. Okay, now let's just take a quick look at, um, at some of uh, the prototype cables that I've designed um, and built that will eventually become kits in the store. So this is a nice, this is a canary end, this is another nice canary end, and it's got a, um, a, nice, a nice braided covering on it. It's basically a high quality Belden coaxial cable. And look at that, it's very, very flexible. This is pretty typical in the industry to have very flexible cables so that you can get, if you have a rear connection like this, you can come out and come back in. So remember number four, functionality. And we're also going to have what I'm going to call a stiff cable. And look at the difference. And this is actually a locking end. So this is really handy for cables that are really long or are dangling off of equipment because you can actually lock it in with just a little twist. And because a lot of our kit amps have jacks on the top, it's really nice to be able to stand the cable up and have it stay put. So you can, you can do a very, very neat installation. So, functionality, aesthetics, yes. And a flexible cable, of course, does, it won't stand. A bigger, longer run of flexible cable will just flop over over time and look awful. Okay, now, what about uh, noise rejection? Well, we had a look at how inside your amp will have a shield cable or will have a component that's in an isolation box or have a shield, um, a braided shield slid over it. There's lots of ways of shielding a uh, delicate signal. Well, the same thing happens when you're moving around audio outside of your preamps and amplifiers. In this case, a coaxial will have, this is, this is your standard RCA cable and it has both a shield and a ground return path on the outside braid. And it's a really good way of balancing the requirements for low noise and practical construction. So a lot of RCA cables are coaxial in nature, but they're not all equal. There are some really good manufacturers of cables and some not so good, and there are some some inexpensive, cheap types of cables, even made by the good manufacturers, that are not the best for audio. So it took a lot of time when I was specking out my own, um, my own prototype builds to find the cable types with the right specs that I liked. Now, what if you are running a balance system? So let's get these out of the way because we don't, we don't need any of this stuff. But if you're running a balance system, everything doubles, right? <laughs> Stay put. So instead of one wire carrying the signal, carrying the whole sine wave, we've got two wires. So we have, let's say, the red wire carrying the positive portion of the sine and the white wire carrying, let's say, the negative portion. So the, the signal is split into two parts and everything doubles. In your preamps and amplifiers, you have, if you had one tube carrying the whole signal, you'd now have two tubes, two circuits, two, two PCBs or a larger PCB. What about in cables? Well, let's just take a look. So here, this is actually a mono um, balance cable. This is um, a new trick. These will actually eventually be part of uh, the kit cable lineup. These are fabulous, they're well made. And because they're mono, they have a, 
a positive, a negative, and a ground connection, so three. If this was a stereo connection, you would have five. You would have, you'd have two for each channel plus the ground return. And yes, I know these are superior in probably every way other than cost to an RCA end, and they, uh, they lock really well. They'll lock together and they'll lock in your equipment really well, and they look sexy. But in my opinion, balanced gear is not as good as running unbalanced. And the simple fact is, if you run balanced gear, you have double the circuitry, you, you've increased the cost fairly substantially, um, and the chances of a phase uh, shift uh, increase exponentially because there there is no phase shifting. Well, the apples to apples moving signals around in um, in one, on one wire versus two wires, you can see quite easily that there's twice as much chance for error. So, anyways, that's my that's my two cents. We don't even have cents anymore. That's my two bucks. <laughs> In, in Canada, we have loonies, so that would be my two loonies worth. Anyways, um, so yeah, so we've run through resistance, capacitance, noise rejection, functionality. And as we move forward this year, because we're going to have kits coming out, first to test builders and then in the store for very affordable interconnects, uh, we'll talk in more detail about how to test your cables, what are the important specifications. You can do a lot of cable testing, all the important cable testing you can do at home quite easily with uh, a good quality volt ohm meter and just a little bit of knowledge. So you can test your existing cables, you can write a spec sheet up, we'll have specs for all of the cables. So yes, you'll be able to compare them to your favorite cable type. And you'll be able to even test your favorite cable type them, see if the manufacturers are being truthful with your specs. That's something to keep in mind as well. And um, yeah, so that's all to come. And what came in this week? Well, I'm glad you asked because a lot came in and Charles is away for another week and I'm holding the fort. So I was only able to test some of what came in. So it'll be a month probably before we get through everything. But I'm going to show you some of the really fabulous stuff that came in. And uh, I'm excited because we were starting to run out of stock. Now, what I'm about to show you are two, in my opinion, two of the top three 6SN or 12SN 7 tubes ever made. The 6 volt version, the 6SN7 of these tubes is basically extinct, or if it's not extinct, they're certainly on the endangered list. Be really careful. If you find some for sale, there's a very good chance that the 6 volt versions um, are selected over many times, that they're noisy, that in fact the testing numbers the seller is declaring are not true. We've been getting burnt more and more often, and we're really careful. And uh, I'm, I am more inclined to buy from people that we know than ever before. So just keep that in mind. In fact, don't buy on Facebook Marketplace. That's where we've lost the most money. Um, <clears throat> but let's take a look at this one here. These boxes are well worth stopping for a moment to take a look. Look at the date, March 1953. A lot of great tubes came out in the 40s and early 50s. And look at that. That is a Tungsol 12SN7 mouse ear. And they are gorgeous tubes. And these tubes, the Tungsols, the early Tungs in particular, particularly the mouse ears, but there's a version like the mouse ear that's almost identical. Same plates, but no... Uh, mouse ear. Um, they have an incredible amount of detail. They're very low noise tubes for the type and um, and a big part of the reason why they're so low, low noise is because the tube is really well 
mounted in the glass, very professionally mounted. And these tubes, of course, were often used for military purposes. And um, we often find them in uh, boxes uh, with uh, Sperry on it. I think these are Sperry's. Yeah, Sperry made a lot of um, specialized uh, aircraft equipment uh, for the U.S. Air Force. And anyways, we have some of these in. Look at the matches on this. It's almost a perfectly matched pair. And the 12SN7, of course, can't be played in a 6SN7 socket. It's one of the main reasons why we ended up developing a universal, um, a universal control preamp and a universal phono preamp, is to make use of these 12-volt tubes that are st sort of still somewhat available. We'd almost completely run out of the mouse ears, and we have some sets in the store now. And um, let's take a quick look at this. This is another set of mouse ears, and look at the difference here. So that we've got a uh, 9% difference between sections, but in a lot of preamps, the first stage and the first stage match perfectly, and the second stage and the second stage match perfectly. So in our universal pre's, this is actually a perfectly matched set. Now, if you have a balanced preamp like the Freya, for example, you actually have to, because you've got, you're using two halves of the tube to handle the, the uh, positive and negative phases, you actually would have to have these balanced or matched, just like, um, just like this set. This would be perfect for a Freya, in fact, if it could handle a 12-volt tube, which it can't. The other thing you've got to be careful of is these are the early spec GTs, and they are roughly one-third lower on key specifications than the, standard, the later modern GTA and GTB. So you cannot plug a 6SN7 GT or 12SN7 GT into most modern amps. They will get noisy. Trust me on this. We got warnings all over the store, and I still end up arguing with customers that end up with problems with modern gear. Um, anyways, just be really careful of that. And if this is in the top three, then this is probably the number one in the top three. And this is a Sylvania bad boy. It's the 12SN7 GT. This happens to be the Jan, Joint Army Navy version. They the standard consumer version and the Jan version, as far as I'm aware, are absolutely identical. So sometimes a military tube will have a higher spec filament or some other spec difference. These I don't think did. And these are amazing sounding tubes. If these tongues specialize in detail that just seems to go on forever, these handle the bass frequencies like no other tube I've ever heard before. It's a refined, clean, clear bass that just, it's, it's just sublime. It's so beautiful. And these have a lovely, warm, rich mid-range, which is really typical of pretty much all the Sylvania tubes. Certainly the 6SN7, 12SN7, 6SL7 and 12SL7s, and quite a few more. And the earlier the type, the more the detail tends to, to be better, and the uh, warmer and richer they tend to sound. And of course, these bad boys come from the 1940s into the early 1950s, and we found a lot of these. And most of them are um, military surplus, and they're new old stock, and we had, like the tongues, we had virtually run out of them. Uh, I think about three or four years ago, I found a lot of both types from the same, uh, from the same wholesaler. And the gentleman um, made me a deal for everything. Uh, and um, I emptied the bank account. It was a huge, huge, it was one of the single largest purchases I've ever made. And those tubes have lasted the last two or three years. And so... I'm really glad to be able to restock, particularly the bad boys, because we've sold a lot of the 12 SN7s over the years, particularly to people who build our universal preamp. And um, and the, the beauty of these 12-volt tubes is that this, with the 6-volt 
uh, version essentially extinct, you ha still have access to essentially the identical tube. It's the same tube in every way except that the filament is the 12 volt filament instead of the 6 volt filament. So I think that's that's wonderful. It's one way of being able to access uh, great sounding vintage early vintage tubes for a little while longer. Eventually these will be gone too, but for now we have inventory. <laughs> well, if you stay this long, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, we've got flat rate shipping that could, we can reach almost everybody in the world for 20 bucks. And if your order is $150 after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim, Missing Charles, signing off. Cheers, everyone.